right one before. I'm usually so careful about what I say. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, The Big Chill, um, with our, our, our speaker, Aaron Patterson. Um, I'm going to start with a few housekeeping things uh, just to uh, make sure we're uh, we have the best experience possible for everybody. Uh, if you're not speaking, we please ask that you mute your mic and uh, uh, turn off your video just because we have some people coming in from low bandwidth areas and we want to maximize their experience or optimize their experience as well. Um, this, re this session is being recorded and it will be posted to the call website after the session. Um, First, though, I'd like to acknowledge that Call CBPA represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut, uh, the Inuit of Natasinan, uh, the Beothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of Wulastuik and Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. And at this point, I'm going to turn the session over to Heather Saunders, who will introduce our speaker, Heather. Thanks, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Heather Saunders. I'm the Dean of Libraries and Archives at Acadia University, and it is my great pleasure to be introducing my colleague, Aaron Patterson. There's so much to say about Aaron that I am going to refer to my notes so I don't miss anything. Aaron is the Head of Research Services at Acadia, as well as the English librarian and the copyright coordinator. Now, as copyright coordinator, she and I liaise regularly because I'm copyright officer. We liaised as recently as the last hour. So believe me when I say that it is incredibly valuable to have her ear. Um, and it's been great because she's got a wealth of background. She's been studying intellectual property issues and monitoring the um, evolving copyright scene in Canada since the mid 90s. So without further ado, I want to wish you all a happy fair dealing week and give a warm welcome to Aaron. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you very much, Heather, for the introduction and thank you to everyone who's here today. Uh, my talk is going to take about 20 minutes, so there will be lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, I first gave this talk or a, an earlier version of this talk back in the fall as part of an Acadia Faculty of Arts uh, research lecture series and the theme of that series was impermanence and as a librarian I'm very aware uh, of the ephemerality of media. Uh, paper is still by far our most reliable medium for long-term preservation and you know, we're all librarians here, so I'm going to say some things you, you know, and I'll try to keep those things short. But um, obviously, our collections have been shifting from paper to electronic for a long time. And I've been thinking about the implications and the consequences of that, particularly as it relates to copyright. Um, but someone recently told me a story <laughs> about impermanence in electronic text that rocked my world um, and is the inspiration for this talk and for uh, a research project stemming out of it. And I'm going to tell you the story, but first I want to comment briefly on some of the problems with electronic texts that should concern us all, both as creators and consumers and mediators uh, of those texts. And again, I'll keep this this quick because we're, we're, I think we're all librarians here. So, you know, electronic texts, obviously very good in so many ways. They're accessible generally, they're searchable, you can underline, you can make notes without destroying, you know, the experience for the next person. You can carry around a gazillion of them on your, on your device. One of my uh, favorite movies is uh, the Merchant Ivory film, A Room with a View, based on the E.M. Foster novel. And there's this scene that I always remember where the 
two of the characters, they're traveling in, in Italy and they're packing up to go home and they're packing like giant steamer trunks full of hardcover books that they you know took with them for their, their journey. Um, so obviously having your electronic text is a little more convenient. You can set your text size, your font, everything. Turn the brightness down so you can read beside somebody else who doesn't want to be bothered by your light. Um, they arrive pretty much instantly. I remember being storm stayed in Montreal once and didn't have enough reading material for the for the trip and being able to just have something delivered immediately is pretty great. You know, for us in libraries, they don't come always instantly, but still much quicker than a, than a print book. So they're discoverable and available very quickly. I could go on, but again, librarians, I don't think I need to. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the bad things that we also probably know about. But some of this was news to me recently. Um, I was very, I'm the English librarian and a couple of other arts disciplines, but like most of us, I've had to cover for other subjects um, for different reasons. So uh, recently I found myself as the math librarian, which is outrageous, but there it is. Um, anyway, very different from English. And uh, I, had, I had a professor request a book for purchase and, you know, it's math. So he wanted an electronic copy. Uh, the paperback would have been 75 bucks. The e version was going to be $1,200 for a single user license. $1,200. And that was to purchase the ebook. But of course, often we're not really or actually purchasing an ebook, we're renting it on the publisher's terms. Um, and I'm sure uh, others of you who work at reference desks or service points will have observed this language shift among students in the last several years. They don't talk about borrowing a book or checking out a book. They talk about renting a book. This rental business, this commercial transaction is, is, is affecting the language they use. Even though I don't think they really mean rent, I think they'd drop in their socks if we actually asked for money at the, at the desk. But um, just an interesting aside. Anyway, these rentals or subscriptions uh, are time consuming to manage. There's no predictability or guarantees from year to year about availability or pricing. There are frequently geographic restrictions. How often have you gone to, to order an ebook and find out huh, not available in our in our area? Just because, um, you know, like DVDs with the different regions. Um, there are frequently access restrictions as well as geographic restrictions. Things like tiered usage and pricing, um, limits on, on how many pages you can print or download, on how many times you can actually use an ebook. Do you remember in the early days of ebooks? And this is more in the public library system, but it was HarperCollins. Oh, they're bad. HarperCollins decided uh, that if a if a library bought one of their ebooks, that after 26 loans, it would vanish, and they'd have to buy it again. Um, that was bad. Uh, the situation is even worse with textbooks. Um, most textbook publishers simply will not sell them. They just won't sell them in electronic format to libraries. I'm sure if they could stop us from buying the print ones, they'd do that too. Um, approximately 85% of textbooks are unavailable to libraries in any format other than print. And uh, the following, I have a list here, is just some of the publishers that refuse to allow libraries to purchase electronic textbooks. Um, Pearson, Cengage, Houghton, Houghton, I don't know how to say it, H-O-U-G-H-T-O-N, uh, McGraw-Hill, Oxford, Elsevier, ooh, Elsevier, Cambridge, Macmillan, Wiley, Blackwell, pretty big names. Um, so textbooks, Textbook publishing's business is to extract as much money <laughs> as possible from as many students as possible, as frequently as possible. So access is now typically limited to one semester um, and then it vanishes. It really truly is a rental. Um, and where libraries can acquire electronic textbooks, they are, as I've already mentioned, exorbitantly priced frequently, thousands of dollars with access limited to a single user or a handful of users at a time, and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars for unlimited access. And in addition to those upfront costs, uh, 
for electronic textbooks, publishers um, often add an additional recurring platform access fee, both of which are, which must be paid annually um, to retain access. Um, that's all bad. Then there's no guarantee that access will actually be retained. Um, even when we do purchase an ebook, um, there's no guarantee we'll have permanent access. Um, this is not the academic library world, but do you remember several years ago when Amazon, they were um, publishers were yanking, just arbitrarily yanking purchased, purchased ebooks from people's Kindles and devices and so on. And more recently, um, on August 31st of last year, right before the start of term, remember Wiley suddenly and without notice or consultation removed more than 1300 titles from purchased ebook collections um, for which academic libraries had already paid. And um, following up on that, some enterprising librarian, I can't remember who it was, um, but somebody dug a little deeper and discovered that the titles that Wiley had removed uh, were the most heavily used ones, the core ones. Um, that's a whole paper right there. But uh, anyway, I did promise I would tell you the story that rocked my world. So here's here's the story. So in my role as copyright coordinator, I am frequently approached by professors who have questions regarding copyright clearance requests made by their publishers. And publishers are, you know, they're businesses and they tend to be extremely risk averse when it comes to copyright. And they commonly demand that authors secure copyright permissions for quotations that are far beyond what is required by Canadian law and accepted academic practice. And when such permissions are requested from rights holders, it is it's common for those rights holders to ask for a one-time payment for those permissions. I mean, they might say, hey, whatever, fill your boots. Um, uh, but, you know, in literary studies, it's not uncommon that they're going to ask for you know, a couple hundred bucks or something. Earlier this year, I received a query that alerted me to a new, to me anyway, new and extremely worrying instance of copyright creep. And a faculty member with a completed book accepted for publication with an academic press in Canada was encountering this usual hurdle of the publisher insisting on written permission for all quotations, no matter how short. That's normal so far. The part that isn't normal and that is inspiring this research project is that one of the copyright holders from whom the faculty member sought permission for a single block quotation of five lines of poetry from a long poem, the rights holder responded not with a demand for a one-time payment, but instead with a demand for a limited licensing fee which would have to be renewed and paid up every five years. Failure to renew and repay every five years would result in the quotations being redacted from the electronic version of the book. I assume you are all gasping in horror, so I'll pause for that. Um, and who knows what they're going to ask for in five years? Like it was quite significant. I forget the exact amount, but it was a lot. And you know, five years could be a lot more. Um, I think that's shocking. <laughs> it gets worse. Um, I heard from the author uh, recently, and not only were they demanding this outrageous licensing fee, the rights holder, rights holder also insisted that the author not publish anything critical of the poet in question. In a, in a piece of literary criticism. So this is outrageous on so many levels. <laughs> so first of all, the uh, publisher's insistence on getting written permission to quote brief passages is completely out of step with copyright law. Um, and I must acknowledge here that um, Canadian copyright law and my understanding of it is still firmly situated in mainstream Western European settler context, and there are entire vast areas of indigenous indigenous knowledge and cultural expression um, that are missing. So sorry about that. Um, that said, 
copyright is the right to copy an entire work or a substantial portion thereof. It's the right to do a bunch of other things too, like to adapt, translate, perform, publish. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'm focusing on the right to copy a work or a substantial portion thereof. And the substantial, of course, matters. If you're not copying an entire work or a substantial portion thereof, you are not in copyright land. Um, there's no need to ask permission or make payment to copy an insubstantial portion of a work. And of course, the obvious question, what's insubstantial? Yeah, it's a, it's a matter of judgment. It's qualitative, it's quantitative. There are no bright lines. Every situation is an analysis, but clearly there are many, many situations where it is insubstantial and no permission or payment is required. And the quotation of brief passages from a work under discussion is just how literary criticism works. You know, it's what we do, it's what we have to do, it's what we're taught to do. It's the only way we're going to make any sense to our readers. And it's almost always well within the terms of the Copyright Act. And even, you know, we talked about substantiality a second ago, even quoting an entire work could be well within the bounds of the Copyright Act. Um, David Weber, who's, you know, huge copyright expert in Canada, and I'm quoting him now, he said, uh, there might be no other way to criticize or review certain types of works without reproducing the whole thing. He gave the example of, of a photograph. Um, I'm talking about literary studies here, so I would use the example of a, a very short poem or like a haiku or something. How could you, you know, write an academic critique of a haiku without probably reproducing the whole thing? Um, even in these rare situations where quoting or copying an entire work is deemed necessary for the purpose of the critique or the review, it is highly unlikely that such quoting or copying would interfere in any way with the market for the work in question. You know, the reproduction in a, in a journal article or a book chapter of a, of a photograph or a painting or a haiku is in no way a substitute for the original um, of a professional reproduction or a limited edition. Um, you know, the reproduction of a few lines, sorry, a huge eagle just went like right by my window, <laughs> squirrel. Um, the reproduction is not gonna dissuade people from buying the original, quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, quoting, uh, you know, one haiku from a collection or a few lines of poetry from a poem is, is much more likely to whet a reader's appetite and to encourage them to buy the entire work and maybe other works by, by the same author. So that story that rocked my world, the redaction of a text, is an example of censorship by copyright. And maybe, maybe it shouldn't have rocked my world um, because I believe that copyright was born out of censorship. It's where it originates, if you will indulge me. In a, in a brief and extremely oversimplified history of copyright, I would like to demonstrate that copyright from its earliest origins is about censorship, control, and cash. So like a lot of Canadian statutory regimes, our Copyright Act is descended from the British, um, from British law as it was imposed upon us and adapted by us with a little sprinkling of French tradition and an ever increasing taint of American influence. Um, the invention of the printing press made widespread dissemination of works possible and the powers that be, uh, the British government and the Church of England basically freaked out and tried to clamp down uh, and man maintain control of what was being published printed. And we saw this echoed again, of course, with the advent of the internet, which was really the next paradigm shift in dissemination of information since the invention of the printing press. And we still today see governments, powerful media companies, rights holder collectives, special interest groups attempting to exert control over dissemination of information. Back to the past. In 1557, to rein in unfettered, uncontrolled publishing, Parliament, British Parliament, conferred a publishing monopoly on an association of printers and booksellers known as the Stationers Company. And this group of printers and booksellers were chosen because they could be relied upon to censor works that spread seditious or heretical views. 
So the whole reason for regulating the right to make and distribute copies, copyright, was censorship. And this monopoly remained in place for more than a century uh, until 1695 when Parliament let the Licensing Act lapse. I don't know why. Um, and the minute that happened, non stationers company uh, printers sprang up like mushrooms. The stationers company freaked out and tried to convince Parliament that the sky would fall if their monopoly, if their monopoly were not restored. And it's very similar uh, to the panic um, that the record companies and the movie uh, companies experienced when they lost control of dissemination through internet technologies like file sharing. Very similar rhetoric uh, running around there. The stationers company lobbied parliament to restore their monopoly, issuing dire warnings that, um, this is a quotation, it's so sad. Widows and children who at present subsist wholly by the maintenance of this property uh, would be thrown into poverty, very much like the recording studios recently lobbying our parliament, Canadian parliament, to tighten copyright laws and clamp down on file sharing and claiming it and claiming to be doing it for the benefit of the artists. Um, back to the 1600s, uh, Parliament did not reinstate the stationer's company um, monopoly. Instead, in 1710, it passed Britain's first Copyright Act, the Statute of Anne, which I can guarantee you I'm going to call a statute at least once. I know it's statute, but that's one that gets by me all the time. Um, and that statute gave authors the rights to their works for 14 years, renewable for another 14 years if the author was still living. And it gave authors the right to assign their rights to a publisher who might or might not be a member of the stationer's company. Like I said, greatly oversimplified, uh, but this is a 20 minute talk and I'm not a historian. So let's get back to today. I believe that copyright is still very much about censorship, corporate control, and cash. Uh, the length of our Copyright Act has grown from the four pages of the Statute of Anne to um, 192 pages. Today, the term of copyright, of course, has grown from that minimum of 14 and a maximum of 28 under the Statute of Anne to life plus 70 in the current Canadian Copyright Act, thanks to NAFTA, or the new NAFTA, Kuzma, whatever you want to call it. Um, but despite its roots in censorship, the stated goal of the Statute of Anne was to promote learning. Its preamble calls it an act for the encouragement of learning. And its first paragraph narrows that lofty goal to the encouragement of learned men uh, to compose and write useful books. Uh, like the Statute of Anne, our current Copyright Act is meant to encourage the production of creative works by rewarding creators. But unlike Anne, our act is also meant to encourage the production of creative works by allowing users reasonable access to existing works. The goal of modern copyright, of course, is to facilitate and further the creation of uh, the creation and the growth of knowledge and culture by striking a balance between creators' rights and users' rights. So we want to ensure that creators are appropriately rewarded for their creations, um, but we also want to promote the public interest by providing access to works for the benefit of individuals and society as a whole. Um, creators, of course, should not be unfairly deprived of income from the use of their work, but on the other hand, the public good should not be unduly impoverished for personal gain. Creators have the, the right to be compensated for their works and to exert some degree of control over their works, but users also have the right to engage with copyright works in different ways, to quote them, to satirize them, to incorporate them into a new work, sometimes to copy them and to share them. Despite these apple pie goals of copyright law and despite the existence of users' rights and despite the Canadian, the Supreme Court of Canada's repeated 
assertion of users' rights, there are countless examples of the chilling effect that copyright overreach has on creative and critical endeavors, and of how copyright can become an instrument of censorship, self-censorship, and undue control. So for a while there, this is a while back, but um, still bugs me. Do you remember Disney? Disney, they're bad. Um, but they were literally suing grannies and children and daycares for, you know, drawing Mickey Mouse on the chalkboard. Um, consider the plight of documentary filmmakers. How do you capture reality without including, even incidentally, all kinds of things protected by intellectual property, background music, artwork, public statuary, billboards, buildings, logos, trademarks, labels? It's uh, it's impossible. And that it does happen. In 2019, um, a Canadian author was sued by the corporation that owns the CN Tower in Toronto, uh, sued for trademark infringement for using an image of the CN Tower on the cover of a fantasy novel. And if you are under the impression that uh, lawyers are humorless, let me disabuse you of that notion by quoting <laughs> from the author's lawyer. The purpose of trademark law is to prevent confusion in the marketplace for specific goods and services and to stop bad actors from passing off counterfeit goods as the genuine article. It seems unlikely that the corporation that manages the CN Tower is active in the business of publishing novels, let alone fantasy novels featuring a strong female protagonist who helps trolls and goblins succeed in the human world through her work at an employment agency. Uh, another lawyer, this one's not funny, <laughs> commenting on this case observed that if every noteworthy if every noteworthy building in Toronto was protected by trademark, a simple picture of Toronto's skyline could require multiple licenses prior to publishing. The necessity to obtain these licenses alongside the fear of potential legal consequences can very well encourage artists to stop or avoid creating certain forms of art. Now, I know I was talking about trademark there, another branch of intellectual property, but, you know, obviously related. Um, let me tell you about Black Locks Reporter, which is a paywalled news site in Ottawa that reports on, you know, government stuff. And their business model is partly selling subscriptions, but it's also very uh, much based on actively trolling and baiting people. They will write an article that mentions someone or some government office and then send a teaser to an implicated party who they know doesn't subscribe and see if they try to access the full article without subscribing. And then they'll try to sue them for copyright infringement. Um, and they go after subscribers who share articles. Um, they'll send them a bill for a full subscription for every article, every forward and sue them when they refuse to pay. Um, others might be more familiar with this case than I am. I've kind of lost track of it a bit, but I, I have a feeling that they may have sued so much, they might have been designated, what is it, like a vexatious litigator? Basically a nuisance? Maybe. I'm not sure about that, but maybe somebody knows and can put it in the chat, which I'm not monitoring uh, yet. Um, yeah, and there's a quotation from, again, back to when the record companies were really freaked out about file sharing and everything. Uh, this is John Turanian, and he said about the future of copyright uh, and the record industry, one can readily imagine a future dystopian world where the record labels, long since irrelevant in the development and distribution of new music, become nothing more than copyright trolls, drawing their revenue entirely from litigation. I mean, we are seeing that with, with black locks and others. Um, think about notice and takedown regimes, which fortunately we, we never had in Canada, but there was certainly a huge amount of pressure, uh, particularly from the United States uh, during previous rounds of copyright reform for Canada to implement a notice and take for ISPs to implement a, a notice and takedown regime where the mere uh, allegation of infringement would require an ISP to remove content. Um, we so far have stuck with notice and notice. Um, where the ISP merely has to forward the notice on to the, the person identified by the IP address. Um, but that's always a danger. Uh, we also saw in the, in the not too uh, far away past uh, attempts to introduce uh, three strikes legislation. Um, France, New Zealand, and the UK have all tried to pass 
legislation that would see accused infringers being denied access to the entire internet after three allegations, merely allegations, not even proven, uh, of copyright infringement. So I'm nearly done. Um, I don't want you to think that I think copyright is a bad thing. Um, creators should absolutely have reasonable control over the copying and usage of their works, reasonable being the keyword. But thanks to the technology that allows them to do it, rights holders are controlling, limiting, and monetizing every single last thing just because they can, just because the technology lets them do it. The demand for licensing of quotations and the threat of redaction raise a very real specter of censorship by copyright and are likely to cast a chill on the field of literary criticism in which quotation of passages under discussion is established practice and essential to the discourse between texts and their interlocutors. And this kind of copyright overreach has the real potential to usher in a digital dark age. And I know that term digital dark age usually refers to the massive loss of historical and cultural information as a result of obsolescence and degradation of data storage formats. Remember paper, most reliable storage medium. But the digital dark era I'm envisioning here would be the result of scholars self-censoring before they even set pen to paper or having publication of a finished manuscript thwarted because of overreaching copyright demands or the redaction of published works. And actually the author at the heart of this story told me that he is so frustrated by this whole situation that he will not ever quote this publisher's authors again. So totally self-censorship in action. Um, on a happier note, he asked me if I wanted to co-author something on all of this stuff. So yes, I do. Um, and I have actually all, um, submitted and, and had it successfully accepted, et cetera, an application for sabbatical leave coming up this year. And my plan is to interview Canadian literary scholars about their experiences with clearing copyright permissions, and also to talk to publishers about their copyright policies and practices. So this talk is really just me dipping my toe into those waters a little bit um, to test them. And I'm really looking forward to your comments and questions, which uh, I'm, I'm certain will inform this very nascent research project. So that that's all I have to say. And I will turn it over to Jacqueline and to all of you. I thank you, Erin. I don't think I've ever used the shocked face emoji <laughs> so much <laughs> in a session before. I just I couldn't get over so many things. <laughs> um, so I haven't uh, seen too many questions come up yet in chat. So if you want to put your questions in chat, you can go ahead there. If you'd like to speak and you want to raise your hand, then I can call on you that way. We'll give everyone I, a minute. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not actually. I, I, I'm I'm kind of terrified of questions, especially copyright <laughs> questions, because they're they're usually the answers usually maybe or it depends on their heart. <laughs> but I'm, I'm I'd be really happy to just hear comments, because um, like I, you know, I I did give an earlier version of this talk back in in the fall, and the comments were great. They really helped me shape it for this talk and going forward for the full research project. So, and yet we have some uh, comments here that they're looking forward to reading and seeing the results of your your research at a future conference. Uh, likes on that one. Uh, Daniel's asking, uh, where do you think Creative Commons could come into things in the future? Oh, yeah, that's a great, great thing to bring up. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, I think we need to do a lot more work um, letting people know about Creative Commons, what it is, how easy it is to use, um, what it can do. Um, it also makes me think of um, open access and open educational resources. Uh, you know, that, that that's gaining steam and I, I hope we'll continue to do so. Um, we really need to, as, as academies, and I'm gonna put my faculty association hat on for a second here too, as, cause you know, most of us academic librarians are also faculty association members. We really need to shift prestige to open access. Um, you know, because it tends to be like the top tier journals are not 
they're pretty locked down or they're, you know, $10,000 for, for author processing fees. Um, the UBC, uh, University of British Columbia, their collective agreement, I believe, explicitly supports open educational resource resources, uh, giving them explicit weight in the renewal tenure promotion process. Um, and I think, yeah, the same should be true uh, for Creative Commons. Do, does anybody else want to talk about Creative Commons or the person who asked the question add anything? That's a really great point about uh, tenure in Creative Commons to add to the prestige and really start building uh, a nice uh, foundation of uh, a scholarly conversation that's just directed down that lane, you know, moving away from those traditional, um, I call them, I guess their prejudices really towards, <laughs> towards our uh, traditional formats and traditional publishing and like it seems like we've made like small steps and we're getting there and I always feel like we're still stuck in the advocacy stage and maybe we'll be there forever. But um, yeah, I stories think I... like yours are going to add to that conversation, right? Like that's going to start to have people think, okay, yeah, you know, it, it actually is really important that I start thinking about how I'm publishing and these moves matter. How yeah. you choose to release your information matters in a much larger scale than you realize. Yeah, I mean, the, the research project I'm envisioning, I mean, yeah, I hope there'll be, you know, I expect there'll be like an academic article or some more than one who knows out of it. But I'm also kind of picturing almost like an expose kind of piece that will have like the, the shock factor is is definitely there. And I hope we'll get academics to pay attention and especially senior academics. You know, they can be choosy. They can afford to be choosy about where they publish. They can really set the the tone for for junior scholars um, who, you know, there's a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. And just uh, while we're talking about setting the tone, I was I was thinking while you were talking, if I if I may, I don't see any other questions that have rolled in the chat, so I'm going to turn it a little bit. What do you think our role is in combating things like this, like the copyright trolling and your story when you're uh, when you're saying how, you know, they asked for this license and I and from what I gathered the author refused and like. They just said we're actually, not using that then, or did they pay it? It's a good question. He actually paid it. I don't know if he's going to pay it again in five years, but I mean, come on, he's got you guys got a finished book. He worked for years yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, he's not happy about it. Um, so uh, what? What's our role in fighting against this kind of thing? Do you think like it's a you know risk av aversion is such a big deal <laughs> to a lot of universities, but at the same time, where is our our responsibility towards a, you know, yeah. fair dealing and furthering this scholarly conversation. Who's going to take up the fight, I guess, is the question. We keep hearing a lot of presentations that say, be bold and use your fair dealing yeah. rights, but who's going to do it? <laughs> no, nobody wants to be the, the test case, do they? I mean, yeah. I'm looking quickly in the, in the list of names here. I see there's some like total copyright heavyweights uh, joining me here who, um, I hope agree with me that we need to do more advocacy. Um, it's hard though, because you know a lot of us, especially at smaller institutions, like I'm doing copyright as one of so many things. I, you know, the, you know, larger institutions are, are fortunate where they can have like a whole copyright office or a whole position that is, you know, copyright librarian and and can do that kind of advocacy. Uh, but I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the one that's going to be able to lead it. I'm doing a little part with this with this project, but um, we need to shine doing, light. Yeah, what you're doing is huge to further that conversation and the advocacy. Bringing these stories to light is a, a huge step. And yeah, uh, stories are what change minds, right? Like yeah. you, we can we can throw all the facts we want mm -hmm. uh, at the you know the heritage and innovation, whoever, you know, the government departments that are responsible for for the reviews of the Copyright Act that are supposed to happen every five years. And thank goodness don't at the moment because things are pretty good in fair dealing land with the statute right now. But um, yeah, uh, you know, we can we can send them all the numbers uh, of how much we spend 
on licensing and, and purchasing and but uh, you know a good story that gets people worked up is going to go way way farther it's just human nature I know yeah, for me I, I can't remember statistics but I can remember a story yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that sticks with me uh, yeah. we have a question from Amanda here as you implied earlier, CFLA and Carl are active in the area of copyright advocacy. It's great to hear stories like the one you presented. Have you ever talked to your MP? MP Perkins is active on this file and in Nova Scotia. I have not. Uh, that's a great suggestion. My MP is Cody Blois here. And yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Uh, but no, I haven't. Um, so yeah, C CFLA and Carl, um, CAUT, Canadian Association of University Teachers, also used to be extremely active in the in the copyright file, even you know so far as 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 requesting and and frequently being granted. I think intervener status in uh, in Supreme Court copyright cases. Uh, it seems to me less so of late. They've been less in, involved, and that might be due to the retirement of Paul Jones, who was the guy. Um, who, who you know knew a lot about it and and really led the led the charge. So it's a shame to see that they've. Uh, so maybe that's another way to do to to do it too. Um, to try to try to encourage CAUT and its librarians and archivists committee to. And maybe they are. And maybe I just don't know about it. Sorry, not. But you know, they got a lot to do. Um, but uh, because they do have that direct access to. So many, I forget the number, what, 68,000 or something academic staff across across Canada. Uh, that would be nice too. Yes, and Amanda to say that their CAT, CAUT is still active. <laughs> and the uh, MP Perkins is the co-chair of the industry committee and the credit for copyright. So great uh, resource there to share your story. Yeah. And just to move to another question from uh, Heather Saunders. Erin, are you sensing much reaction from faculty to the 50 to 70 year switch with Kuzma? Nothing. I don't think people know. I haven't heard a peep from anybody except other librarians like on discussion lists and stuff. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if others yeah. have. Yeah, same. Yeah, like, you know, I see I mean, those copyright giants, Amanda's here, Don's here, I don't want to miss anybody, I'm not looking through the whole list, I'm just, I've got the alphabetical, so I'm seeing A through D here. Um, no, not a peep. I'm still annoyed as heck about it, but seemed completely <laughs> unnecessary. As a former chief negotiator here, they did not need to throw that in. <laughs> Go ahead, Heather. Um, just slightly off topic or going back to an earlier topic. I, when you said Cody Bloy, I remembered that I have a calendar of his right nearby and I just checked it and there's nothing in here anywhere about copyright on any of the photos. And I know it gets tricky with photographers, you know, maybe they gave the rights, but uh, there's not a single photographer's credit given. So yeah, he'd probably benefit from a little chat about copyright. Anyway, there's your, there's your introductory, uh, your introduction. You can come in with the calendar. <laughs> I know. <noticed. laughs> anyway, uh, back, back to the others. This, um, <laughs> this story sooner. Cody uh, actually brought his boss, the prime minister, to lunch at my husband's restaurant right before the pandemic, like literally a week before the pandemic. His Sophie Gregoire Trudeau was in the UK at the time getting COVID. Um, <laughs> well, Justin Trudeau was eating lunch and I... Uh, we talked about other things, unfortunately. <laughs> Not, yeah, he probably doesn't have a direct interest in copyright, but yeah, Cody's around. But yeah, um, Perkins, thank you, Amanda. And Simon shared that CBC did an okay story on term extension, <laughs> which uh, I, it was kind of funny. Like I even, um, I had a, a small uh, webinar last week for the faculty here about the copyright term extension and the only people that turned up were other librarians. So. <laughs> yeah, was that Mark Swartz's piece? I saw that. <laughs> oh, thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Erin or other stories that people want to share? Have you encountered something similar?
that wild story. Yeah. Um, I know that the author that I was talking about and um, another colleague of mine here at Acadia who's ha having similar, not quite similar, not the licensing, but she's working with a publisher that is saying a, uh, anything more than 5%, you got to get permission. So at least, I mean, maybe it's good that at least they're allowing some, but 5% is arbitrary and not accurate. Uh, they've started that they've started trying to compile a list of, of publishers who don't insist on permissions like that, and their list has one name on it so far. One, Ohio State. Hmm. <laughs> the shocked face again. Yeah. It'll be really interesting talking to the the publishers uh, when I get yeah. to that stage. So. Yeah. Yeah, hooray for sabbaticals. Very excited. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Aaron? So Carl's preparing a term extension FAQ that should be available in a few weeks. And that's great. I saw a, a copy of that in draft form. It looks like it's going to be very helpful to everyone. Well, I'm really grateful for everyone who showed up and um listen to me and <laughs> obviously very interested in this stuff. So I hope you are as well. Lots of thank yous, lots of praise. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Heather brought you, <laughs> brought you your talk to our attention because that was just uh, fascinating and a side of copyright and fair dealing that really we need to focus on a bit more the practical implications of of uh, fair dealing and where we what we can actually do with it in asserting our rights. And, yeah. <laughs>